What does the UK's procurement bill mean for innovation, particularly from the public sector? And where are the opportunities for contracting authorities, both local, regional and national? And to give you some context here, the UK spends around £300 billion a year on public procurement. And that's spent on how do we get best value from the market with the goods and services we buy? And what we recognize is innovation procurement, innovation friendly procurement is key to growth. And what we need to recognize is with the public sector, with the Procurement Act changing this year, what opportunities that, does that create for all of us as both buyers and sellers? And the landscape that we currently work, operate in is budgets are tight. Whether you're a local authority, a regional authority, or a central authority, you need to do more for less. And that's because we've got challenges that are incredible around social care, around housing, around child services, and also citizen expectations are greater. But whilst it feels difficult, there is an opportunity. And that opportunity is that the whole, with innovation, technology is rapidly changing. And what that's doing is it's creating new types of innovators to enter the market. That could be startups, that could be scale-ups, that could be corporates with R&D teams. And what we need to do is how do we unlock value from those innovators that are in the market space? And as a result, how do we use procurement to bring that value in? So I'm delighted that we've got fantastic panel panelists here, very diverse from different types of organizations, both made up of buyers and sellers. So as I'm, Sam mentioned, I'm the head of the Innovation Procurement Empowerment Center at the Connected Places Catapult. Previously, I used to be the head of Open Innovation at Transport for London, where it's a 10 billion pound business. 7 billion, very close to Vern, 7 billion was spent on the procurement side, on, on the supply chain. We were fortunate to be involved with things like the open data activity, so you don't always have to innovate through purchasing. You can also innovate through data, you can innovate through assets. And how do you stimulate the market to create new value? So what we will do is we'll kick off with each of the panelists, perhaps starting with you first, Vernon, and, and working through, is if you could introduce yourself and perhaps a brief uh, statement on what does market innovation mean to you in the public sector? Thanks, Prakash. Uh, afternoon, everybody. My name's Vernon Everett. I'm the Transport Commissioner in Greater Manchester, so I advise uh, Andy Burnham and the 10 uh, district leaders on, on, on all things transport. And we're creating an integrated London-style public transport and active travel network in Greater Manchester called the B Network. And I guess uh, I know absolutely nothing about procurement. I'm just very grateful for colleagues uh, who do, who uh, are actually writing in to uh, our requirements things that are really going to change the lives of people that live and work uh, in Greater Manchester. And the, I guess the best example of that recently has been our decision to bring the buses back within the control of the Mayor and the 10 district authorities. And that challenged us as a combined authority and as Transport for Greater Manchester to, to write in to those franchises uh, things that maybe you might not have done were it just a straightforward private sector contract. Uh, and one of the interesting discussions that we've been having with bus companies and with people that fit <coughs> automatic ve vehicle location systems onto the buses and all the software that goes with that and all of the data that needs to be driven from it. I think the, the sorts of conversations that we've been having are quite different again, to the ones that you might have in a commercial contract because everything that we're doing is done in the public eye and people expect everything back out to them, including all of the data that we gather in an open and consumable form. Because what we're doing is open to an enormous amount, quite rightly, because it costs a lot of money, an enormous amount of public scrutiny. And therefore, the types of conversations we're having and the types of provisions that we're writing into our procurement documents really lend themselves to be an open, public, transparent uh, set of arrangements. So that, it's bus franchising that's the, the nearest thing uh, to us at the moment that's driving change. And I'll come back to you with another question on that in a second, Bernard. And, and then Flora, again, what does, what does, if you could introduce yourself and tell us, what does market innovation mean to you in the public sector? Yeah, sure. Hi all, Flora from Viva City. We're a London-based scale-up providing AI-based hardware uh, sensors 
uh, to provide transport data to local and regional authorities such as TFGM, uh, TFL and many other uh, authorities across the UK. And I was kind of thinking about this question in, in two sentences. The first is we were a market disruptor. We were bringing computer vision to transport data collection, where previously a lot of legacy technology is pretty limited, doesn't provide scalable data collection, uh, it's pretty manual. Uh, and we were um, facilitated and helped by, by Catapult and by authorities that were willing to sort of um, push the edges of what, what they were willing to do with their transport data collection in the early days. Uh, and that helped us get a foot in and, and develop our kind of base level solution. And then as we're growing and as we're working more closely with the likes of TFGM, TFWM, I might talk about in a, in a bit more detail later, they're enabling us uh, by working with us to bring more innovation based on that core technology. Uh, and that's what's um, really interesting if you're looking at working with SMEs on an ongoing basis, like keep bringing the problems and the challenges because we want to solve them. Thank you, Flora. And same question, Leo. Um, so uh, I'm the CEO of Tended. Uh, we are a, a technology startup. Uh, we're about 40 people that focuses on building really accurate GPS positioning devices for individuals, mainly for the rail industry. So our devices are used to prevent individuals straying onto live lines, which um, over the past uh, decade or so has killed, I think, like 12 people or 11 people. Um, so it's really about safety, critical wearable devices. In terms of how procurement innovation is important to us, um, we've had some very interesting experiences selling into uh, the public sector. Um, mm -hmm. We've had contract durations that have taken six months to get through to procurement and then right at the end they've said um, sorry we've run out of budget and then um, the only way they do, can do it with us if we reduce our cost by 200 grand um, so it is very important at the moment I think the procurement act potentially has some opportunity for change um, but um, what I can say as a sort of a technology uh, leader is that it is really, really important that something is done because often the public sector requires much more complex <coughs> solutions that could be just purchased off the shelf um, and those complex solutions are expensive um, and unfortunately if they aren't willing to move at the pace of uh, what's required for an organisation of, of our um, kind of state and uh, age um, organisations like us, unless they're lucky to get uh, external funding, um, can often struggle. Um, you know, we're fortunately to be in the position where we did get external funding, but I know so many others that have been shut down just because of the long procurement timelines and something needs to change, otherwise our public sector is going to be left behind um, with all of the new innovations that are ongoing at the moment. Thank you, Leo. And I'm also glad we've got a lawyer here in the room, because sometimes people do use legal as an excuse not to procure. So, Amadi, do please introduce yourself. Uh, that's a great introduction. That, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amadi Gill. I'm the National Head of Public Sector at Trams and Hamlins. We're an international law firm, uh, and, and I lead all of our procurement activity at central, regional, and local government levels. So, for me, I think procurement does get a hard rap and actually it doesn't always deliver what it could do and I think there's a duality to how innovation can be incorporated. I, I, at first I think it needs an internal focus, yeah. uh, the organisation really needs to have a cultural reset around procurement, it's not a hurdle, it's not a barrier to actually getting innovation nor is it a process, actually it can be a delivery mechanism which has innovation hard baked into what the output is. And I think the Procurement Act, which we're gonna talk uh, about in a little more detail uh, in a moment, actually allows that in a much more um, facilitative way than we previously, previously have seen in terms of the EU regime that uh, has preceded it. Not that there's anything wrong with the EU procurement regime, I just think there's a very different approach that's been taken by Ca Cabinet Office and UK PLC. Um, and the duality, so if internal is one aspect of it and cultural reset and cultural change around procurement, the other is how you engage with the market. I think Leo's example of being burnt at the very last minute is actually a not that uncommon and I'm sure other issues that other bidders would say is difficult specifications, a failure to understand what the market really can deliver, going down a kind of buy, buy off the shelf kind of solution uh, and actually hampering innovation through over specification and not really talking uh, to us in a meaningful way that allows us to actually really showcase 
all of the innovation that is available. So I think the, the, the second piece of that is how you converse with the market in a meaningful and honest way that allows you to build something that is really specific and delivers outputs. But in order to do that, you have to know what you want. Uh, and again, I think the Procurement Act really emphasizes those points. Thank you, Amadou. Finally, George. Yep. Um, last but not least, uh, everyone stole my line, so <laughs> I'm trying to come up with some fresh content. Um, <laughs> On this spot as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I run um, Tech City Ventures last 15 years. Um, we're a venture fund, um, but uh, we also have a well-funded economic development consultancy where we work for a number of cities around the world. We run something called the, the Global Innovation Collaborative, where we're working with um, a number of large cities, New York, uh, Berlin, London, etc., cetera, on um, you know, things like joint procurement collaboration, unlocking data, enabling us to be able to understand how contracts are being used, incentivizing SMEs around pre-procurement collaboration, I'm sure some of these buzzwords will be going into today. Um, and if you're in this space, you'll know all about it. And it's also great to be part of a room that actually really loves procurement, because <laughs> I think it's quite sexy. I think procurement is now, it's the time for procurement. Um, we work with a lot of um, chief procurement officers from FTSE, um, my background is in um, innovation consulting. I run PwC's Global Innovation Initiative, um, and um, I learned a lot there around how SMEs and our portfolio as well really struggles with accessing government. So a big part of the value we offer through our economic development consultancy is actually enabling paths um, and looking and reinvigorating frameworks in partnership with government to actually enable more SMEs to be procured. Um, so yeah, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, George. Um, and then perhaps, Werner, coming back to you, obviously you've done some really impressive things both in Manchester and London. And firstly, why is innovation important to cities and citizens? You know, what's your perspective on that? And sometimes there's this conversation of buy or make, because a lot of money is spent internally just to build innovative stuff. How you, you were involved with the open data work, which we did together, or even the bus franchise. Why did you go outside? Why not just do everything internally? So perhaps three questions there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I'll take them all at once. <laughs> Sorry. And, and see. Yeah. I, I think the, the answer is that because no one organisation has got all the solutions for improving urban life, um, and not just urban life, actually 40% of Greater Manchester is rural. So when you actually look at the, the range of challenges that we've all got in improving people's lives, and of course I, I work in the transport sector, so transport is it's not a thing really in itself, it, it's an enabler of everything else. It, it enables access to education, jobs, homes, and hopefully improve, improving productivity uh, in, all, in all of our great second <coughs> regions around the country. And you can't you just can't deal with that on your own. So you, you have to throw the problem out there um, and, and stimulate new thinking, stuff that you wouldn't have thought about yourself. And, and just, just going to the... Rakesh and I worked Transport for London a decade or so ago when we decided to make all of our transport data freely and openly available to developers. Uh, and we started off, I think, with bus locations, yes, right. yeah. then went on to tube locations, and then we went on, you know, and then we got the whole lot out. And we learned an enormous amount, actually, about what was useful and what wasn't to the, to the customers right. of that. And I think, as Matt and others who run City Mapper, for example, many of you might, might, might use it, he'd say, well, we wouldn't have got off the ground unless we could take a nice API from you, plug it into our product, Rakesh and I would still be writing the business case <laughs> at yep. TFL to develop that product, yep. but by getting the data out there, lots of other people could come and play with it mm -hmm. and, and turn it into really useful products and services. And it further stimulated the creation of the London Data Store, uh, which the Greater London Authority host, which puts transport data next to health data, next to environmental data, and has enabled people to start thinking about Cross silo, what all that stuff adds up to in terms of making city regions more livable. So, the, 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 I think the, the core answer is you can't fix it all yourself and you have to be open you know, to chucking the problem out there and then engaging. And I take exactly the point about um, how hard we are to deal with, which I think you put very politely. <laughs> but um, 
it, it's, it's quite difficult both ways actually for bandwidth and, and for all the various roles and regulations but we found a way through I mean we found a way through with your with your organization so you know it's, this stuff's doable Thank, thanks very much and perhaps Flora and Leo here in terms of your experiences working with whether it's a local authority or a large body like TFL how did you find it? What, perhaps what were some of your frustrations, but also what are some of the hacks to actually work through these complicated organisations? Perhaps start with you, Flora, first, and then Leo. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I, I don't think it's as hard as we're making it out to be, and I don't know if that's a reflection of us and we've done something, something right, or perhaps it's the, the solution that we provide. Um, but I think we're talking about two levels of getting into a uh, public sector organisation. One is getting like in the door, which is really hard if you are trying to disrupt a category or bring something kind of completely new because you've always got your legacy providers and when, and I've spoken about this on panels with Rakesh in the past, it's all about really understanding what are the problems and pain points that the authority is facing because that's the point of innovation, right, is to actually solve more problems that people are facing. Um, and going hard on it and having those conversations with uh, the people who actually have to experience the issues um, and then making sure that that's quite clear, the, the challenges that they're facing and the, pro like the solution that you're providing to those challenges, to procurement and to kind of more uh, senior sort of director levels who are going to have to have their name against um, something that might be seen as risky. And then the second element, um, and, and, and that's actually what we did with TFGM, which is uh, bringing from 5G innovation funding uh, a really, really technically difficult um, way of managing uh, junctions through signal control and using AI algorithms to understand, okay, well, what's actually the, the most optimal um, flow of um, road users through a junction? And that's, that's really, really hard, and it required innovation funding and kind of that mentality of, like, let's try something big and difficult and see how it goes. Um, the second thing that we're talking about, which I think is where we're at now, which is maybe a little bit different to where you are, Leo, is um, now we're kind of uh, working with the majority of UK local authorities and transport authorities. We're thinking, OK, how do we build on this? What more challenges are there? And how do we have that same kind of innovative mindset, even though we're not as small and not as scrappy? Um, and building on what they've already invested in. Because I think that there's a little bit of a concern, not a concern, but there's a, um, uh, a pitfall that you can fall into thinking, okay, we've innovated in that space, let's move on to the next thing. But actually, the investment that you've put into those technology providers can compound and actually be much more efficient if you grow with them. And that's the challenge mm -hmm. where, and I raised this in the meeting prep, is what about the big contract kind of holders with authorities, consultancies, contractors, who maybe aren't as open to kind of innovating because it probably makes their life a little bit more difficult, but it actually, in the end, provides value to, um, to their clients. And that's where I think we can maybe see some, some benefits from the Procurement Act, um, the sort of open dynamic frameworks, being able to kind of latch on to frameworks and not be closed out for eight years. That's quite exciting for us. And just a really quick follow-up. So how are you, you're working with lots of local authorities across the UK. Yep. How are you getting in? You know, what's your initial step? Are you going into big tenders or how are you, how are you getting into the organisations? I think the, the answer is that it depends and that's probably where we're successful. We're willing to kind of go in and work out how does it work for this authority yep. to try to either get a very small scale um, pilot off the ground and yep. be able to have a proof of concept. We did that with Brighton. Um, and that proved really, really beneficial. Or go really big, like we did with Nottingham, and we spent four years working with them. They had Transforming Cities funding, um, and they have covered their network with our data and are looking to then build on that innovation to um, when they become a greater combined authority. So I guess it's the talking to them and actually working out what works for them as opposed to going in all with a one-size-fits-all. So, so thank you. And Leo, in terms of sharing your experiences, so how are you avoiding local authorities being too prescriptive? How do you bring them back? So maybe share your reflections and perhaps touch on that point, please. Um, just quickly, I think the yeah. second point was really, really interesting yeah. because we're now at that stage where we're experiencing that where once you're through the door, it makes a big difference and actually having conversations with them about wider opportunities once you're already on that framework, yeah. it becomes a lot easier to grow existing revenue channels with one client than it is to go out there and get lots of new clients that are all in the public sector. Okay. Um, in terms of maintaining... Yeah overly complex specifications, it's hard. Um, one of the things that 
we often find with the rail industry, because most people are engineers uh, through and through, is that they will over-engineer everything and try and solve too many problems um, before they even have the first, uh, the first initial application. And a prime example we had recently was the use of our technology to um, alert when a, a boom, which is a crane arm, goes over a railway line when they're doing ALO work. At the moment they have a person watching and they sometimes have a stick um, which they'll get out. Um, we were saying, well look, we can put one of our devices on one of your boom arms and then the second it goes out it will give you an alert in under half a second. And they said, no, it's not good enough. It needs to lock the, um, the crane arm out and stop it before it even gets there. And my response was, well, why does it need to do that? Because right now you're using a stick. Like, it's a lot better than a stick. Um, <laughs> but apparently, um, you know, they want it much, much further. Um, and then it always comes back to cost, right? And one thing that we learned probably about three years when we first started working with Network Rail was, oh, you know, they're a big organisation, they've got all this money, let's bend over backwards, let's do things, you know, near, near, um, uh, for zero. Uh, and now we're in, and I, I, I do kind of take this uh, with a pinch of salt, which is that we are in a good position, that our technology is now so well respected in the industry, but um, we're a lot more forceful in our position, so um, if they want to have a conversation, it's, it's we need to have a conversation about budgets. Um, something that's worked really well for us is, getting a good stakeholder and then having a very open and honest conversation about what's your budget. Sometimes they shouldn't normally tell you that, but if you've got a good enough relationship and you say, what's your budget, they'll tell you and then you can go in a few grand lower than that. Um, and that normally means that things can go a lot faster because if you go over their budget, then it's best and final. And then if you're over that best and final, it's not over the budget, then sometimes that can get put out, which we've had in the past before. Um, so uh, so yeah, that's, that's kind of our, our, our our main advice is just having those open and honest conversations and also sticking to your ground. We, the rail industry, if anybody's from here, probably knows that everything is quite slow and things get delayed. Um, it's a very common thing. Um, it's not just trains that get delayed. And um, one uh, a good example we had just recently was that they were due to start a project three months ago and then they didn't start it. But then they kind of right at the end said, actually, you know, we're ready to go now. We gave them two days. And then after that two days, we said, right, well, that's it. You know, you've got to pay us for another three months now. And then they did that again, only had a couple of days in there. And then we said, well, look, if you want it, you've got to pay for a full two year contract. Um, and unfortunately, you know, they just had to pay. And um, I think it's about holding your ground with them um, is really important because I think there's a bit of a, an attitude um, I don't know about other sectors, but um, in the rail industry where um, they believe they can throw their weight around and um, take SMEs for granted. And I think that we should really start standing back and saying, no, you know, our budgets are a lot tighter than yours um, and you need to start respecting them. Thank you, Dale. And, and before I bring George and Emma deep in, it's a question for any, any through anyone really, is who's the buyer? Is there always one buyer in the public sector or are there multiple people in the organisation? In my opinion, that's one of the biggest problems, yeah. is that your, your buyer yeah. and the people that want it, they aren't the people that are actually sorting out the procurement. And what we'll often have is we'll have uh, a, a key stakeholder and a sponsor that will bring us up to a stage and then they'll move us over to procurement. And then procurement starts to put um, requirements in the specification and you're looking like, you know, where is this coming from? Who's telling you that you need this? And in my opinion, sorry, but it is often procurement who causes the most amount of grief. You know, if it was just down to and the, the sponsor had um, the responsibility to bring most of it through the procurement um, chain, we would be able to move a lot faster and have much more successful projects. Um, you know, we often end up in situations where a project that's ongoing because we're going through different funding points and growth, they have big three month gaps between them. And when you're working with um, track workers that are super traditional, during those gaps they get disengaged and then they get distracted with something else and then it's, you've got to basically start everything up again um, and often it is down to the procurement being the buyer rather than the, the sponsor being the buyer. Anyone want to come back on that before I hand it off? Yeah, I mean yeah. Uh, procurement departments um, do come in typically at the end of the process and they can be a blocker. I think they are somewhat predictable beast in terms of understanding uh, what is the levers that they need to achieve. And um, I think often a lot of the companies in our portfolio that have gone from enterprise to government have really had a bit of crossing the chasm experience because you know it is a bit of a leap in terms of adjusting how you sell um, to a government department. Like know your frameworks, for example, before you go in there. Know what single source supply um, targets and or, or rather levels are. Um, and also know from experience by looking at their contract data, which you can do, um, at what point do they then try and push you onto a framework? Because 
Typically, public sector departments are very open for doing single source supply for pilots and things like that, low level contracts. And all of a sudden, you know, a startup's expecting renewal. And last year was a nightmare because they weren't getting investment unless they <coughs> were showing their MOR rhetorics. And um, they were, you know, getting stuck because they were sorry, you now need to go into a framework uh, after a two year opportunity. So I think it is about also companies really understanding the yeah. nature of the beast because I don't think, personally, from my experience working, I've sold a lot to to UK government and councils um, that they're that different in terms of their procurement approach. Mm. They are uh, fundamentally all following some of the same rules and there's a similar culture. Um, so yeah, I would say it's more of a knowledge exercise in my opinion. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. And, and I guess one reflection on it is sometimes you hold large budgets in the public sector, which we did, but it doesn't mean I'm the buyer. Quite often what would happen is, I would say something like, this is interesting. And suddenly that startup would then hang on to us for months and months. That was the worst thing we could say. It's actually the better thing we could say is talk to that person. They can either tell you whether it's right or not, and they can bring the right people around the table. Because otherwise, you invest a lot of time and effort constantly emailing, and I'll be saying I've forwarded it on, and nothing happens for six months. So, yeah. is, it, is this a scouting exercise, or is this a procurement exercise? Yeah. You, know, like you need to ask, the, ask, ask that yeah. question. Yeah. <laughs> and, and George, one for you, just is in terms of Nitrous, you've tried to bring innovation in the public sector across, across the world in different cities. Mm. Any good case studies that stand out for you where it's innovation through procurement has worked? Um, I think closer to home, I won't say it necessarily worked, um, yeah. but... Uh, you know, we were contracted four years ago by the GLA, three years ago, uh, to develop a, um, essentially an SME procurement platform. So we uh, aggregated a number of government data sets, uh, but then that only got us so far, and we had then had to work with all 33 London boroughs of 32 plus one uh, to uh, actually get their uh, contract data, which was a lot of fun, as you can imagine. Partially because there was really no incentive for them, apart from their saying this is a thing, um, and challenging them on some of their funding streams. But then also, um, they, um, uh, for low single source supply under 10K contracts, uh, there's no mandate uh, to publish that contract data at the time. And also, um, you know, there's no incentive. So ultimately, that is what enables first pilot SME opportunities. It's a huge opportunity. Uh, the, the lever that the public pound has in that part of the market to stimulate innovation, I think, is one of the biggest you know, um, unmet opportunities that we have. But anyway, the point, the point I was going to say is that developed the platform, developed some beautiful data sets, um, but we just couldn't get that last piece. And that's why I'm absolutely thrilled about the UK Procurement Act yeah. 23 and what it's doing. I was involved with the, the Green White Paper three years ago and seeing now what, um, sorry, the Green Paper, uh, Green White Paper, that's new. Um, uh, and um, now actually mandating contract details, contract expiry dates, for example, being able to identify what are the solutions being procured. That's coming up for expiry in three months. Do you have a solution that can fit in for that? Is there pre-procurement collaboration opportunities? Is there joint procurement opportunities between councils? Uh, right now, uh, I did check before I came, there's four different boroughs all buying EV charging infrastructure for roadside um, charging. Bonkers. All buying it separately, all very similar procurements, will be. I didn't look in that much detail, there is probably differences, but there is a very obvious opportunity there for uh, procurement collaboration yeah. and we're stuck in fender locking uh, the you know, startups obviously suffer that but obviously councils and, and the public budget really suffers that um, and it's stifling SME procurement targets since 2015 we've been stuck on 25 to 30 percent of SME procurement nothing's changed it's actually gone down this year uh, they extended the target to 2022 it, you know again was unmet so you know there's a there's a there's a, there's a problem so, so I failed that, uh, in that project. Uh, uh, so, 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 so George raises some interesting challenges. The new procurement acts. I mean, do you, you know, how do you think it will help tackle some of these barriers that George sets out? Uh, and, and they're great challenges for yeah. everyone, actually. And, and I think they're, they're real, yeah. um, both uh, as a consequence of a restrictive interpretation of what has followed, yeah. um, and it goes back to that cultural point, but also yeah. you know, the, the new regime is yeah. transformative in that it's not um, it, it's it's much more process and output driven rather than uh, it's just a, a mechanism to get to an end goal and you have to tick certain boxes and what I think the cabinet office through through the green paper through engagement with the market and multiple stakeholders has come up with is a package of changes yeah. that I think will can be transformative and, and validating in terms of approach and um, hard baking innovation throughout every step. 
pre-market engagement yep. has been available for a very long time but there's a reticency to use it to have the genuine conversation because you do not want to see that you're predetermining yeah. an outcome yeah. by talking to Leo yeah. or talking to Flora. And this is well before the tender stage. Yeah, absolutely. Well yeah. before tender stage. The most successful projects that I have been involved in are the ones that have invested the most time before they start talking to the market because they are sophisticated, they understood what's available, and they have refined their approach in accordance with that. And actually, it's great to get knowledge from everyone out there. Uh, and, and actually, what the new act does is give you much more uh, uh, detailed uh, set of requirements in terms of what you can and can't do, yeah. up to um, talking about what the process itself looks like, what the award criteria can be, what the contractual terms. It is such a fundamental part. Yeah. And then we go on to the actual approach. You have only two procedures now, an open procedure, which is very to the market, um, give me something yeah. back. But the competitive flexible free, uh, procedure is a new way of actually designing something that is absolutely bespoke yep. to what it is you require. So it can be a design competition, it can be a negotiation exercise, it can be, I have got a problem, I don't know what the solution could look like, can you help? It can involve funding, it can involve re research and design. And actually, what if you've done the exercise of speaking to the market, understanding what your problem is, you can then actually build a process that is delivered to your problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. And actually, that is a unique gift. And then mm -hmm. you can award um, on uh, the, the most yeah. advantageous yeah. tender. It's not about yeah. money. Yeah anymore. Yep. It's not about the, a race to the bottom that we've seen a public sector rush yep. to because it itself is confined financially. Um, but it's, it can be about, is this the best technology? Yep. Uh, am I actually getting open access? So I, there is no vendor lock-in yep. to this solution. Can I get the intellectual property? Am I being able to actually invest and get refresh in what yep. I'm doing? And so all of these taken in aggregate are a fundamental step change. Thank you. And in terms of that multi-stage element, mm. how does it work? What's the start process and what can you do with it? So, and this is the beauty of yeah. a competitive flexible procedure. There is no limitation yeah. in what you can do. Now, multi-stage approaches where you are knocking people out um, is, you know, absolutely the, the way forward if you've got a complex project, you want to refine your market. Yeah. Now the problem is, the, the danger uh, is every time you knock somebody out of something, there is a, a, a higher likelihood of a challenge at that point. Now risk aversity, we've heard about that and the consequences it can have on the procurement and the mentality of over-engineering out a potential risk challenge. Um, I think multi-phase projects where you are actually not just talking, perhaps you're yeah. developing something, perhaps you're funding in something, perhaps you're able to actually have open conversations. It's a prerequisite and I love the fact that the competitive flexible procedure can be built in any way, shape or form that allows you to deliver what it is you want. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Um, has anyone got a question from the audience? We've got time for a couple. If not, we'll, ca we'll carry on the conversation. Any, any, any questions? Please. So, cards on the table. I'm, I'm from the Crown Commercial Service. Please. Yep. Oh, there's a map. <laughs> cards on the table. I'm from the Crown Commercial Service, and I'm guessing you've talked about frameworks, and clearly, hopefully, you know about what we do. Just a couple of points that I'd like to point out is that the Crown Commercial Service has a SME champion that you may not be aware of. We are encouraging smaller businesses to join some of the frameworks. DPSs, for example, that are easy to join and actually help to bring innovation to the public sector, it, 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 they are beginning to use it more and more. The other thing, and, and, and Amadeep, you just mentioned it, engaging the market first. Often, those that want whatever the outcome is that they want, don't often know what the best thing is. Mm -hmm. And we encourage our buyers yeah. Um, to engage the market <coughs> and to see what's feasible, yeah. what's practicable, and actually what sort of levels of cost are going to be involved. And it's just great that you're talking about these mm. sorts of things. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, go for it. George. Yeah, just really, I, I, I really like the point of, of yeah. you know, art of possible, so kind of fundamental innovation principle of like you don't know what you don't you, know, you don't know what you don't know. Um, uh, but yeah, I think it's very very essential. Um, but I, I quickly wanted to mention about how I think. Um, the, 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 
the thing that we see the biggest issue is, is that companies like startups, they go into this process and they waste a lot of time mm -hmm. because they realize that they, you know, they can't work the organization. Simple thing, just put your challenges on your website. <laughs> just create a page and just put your challenges, please. Um, and it will just really help just with that initial process of fit and understanding. And of course, then opening the conversation about actually how that company can help you. It's amazing. Like I, I, you know, on a lot of the government websites, there's no talk about what your actual challenges are. You've got to help the market a little bit, meet them a couple of steps um, in, in that process. Can I, can I just jump in? Of course. Maybe with a bit of a challenge there, but also a challenge on what we've just been talking about with all of the pre-market engagement or, or stuff that we're doing. I mean, this is lovely in a utopia where public sector organizations have loads of time, loads of resources, the ability to really, I don't know, collaborate and think about what are, what are our challenges going to be, get buy-in from across the business, or get procurement officers speaking to loads of people and feeling empowered to, to do that. Like, we don't have that. Like, we don't have like, officers who have enough time to, to go into that. So, so, so maybe a question for Vernon, the building on that is, you created a good culture of innovation in the organization. You let people have the autonomy. How did you do it? And what were you worried about when you were doing it? Um, worried about everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> which, is, which is why you just wanted to get other, other people's yeah. minds on it. Well, let, let's, if I can, I'll, I'll go back to the open data debate that we had that long ago, Rakesh. Do you remember we were saying, let's do this because our waters tell us that getting this stuff out will stimulate other things. <coughs> I couldn't write a business case for it. I couldn't put a BCR on it. Yeah. I couldn't put anything like that on it. And so we broke it down into non-frightening sized chunks, didn't we? And started doing things a bit at a time to prove, to prove what yeah. was possible. <coughs> And, um, and then that started to produce evidence to yeah. do more of it. Yeah. And, and that, that was the way that we, that we got into it, I think. If you make something too big and too scary, I'll go to one of my little pet ones. Yeah. In London, those of you that use the London Transport Network have been used to tapping and going for how, however long. The Oyster car was 2003, the contact was payment was 2011. And I remember the person that stimulated that, our good colleague Shashi Verma, the first day I joined TFL in 2007, said the Oyster card is old hat. It's contactless payment next. And he yeah. rolled straight into it. Yeah. And he'd had the credibility because of Oyster just to yeah. keep, that, keep that rolling. But that, those systems aren't available anywhere else outside London. You can find them anywhere else in Europe or in the US, I mean, we used to flog Oyster to around the world, to New York and Sydney, and, but it's not anywhere else. And my question always is, is innovation, and innovation is great, AI helping us improve road safety, helping us improve the punctuality and reliability of our services, it's all great, but I cannot for the life of me work out why we are 10, 15 years on was something that's so straightforward technologically, and you have it in London, you don't have it anywhere else in the country. There's something wrong there. And some of that's politics, some of that is procurement, some of that is reinvention of the wheel by all different yeah. authorities. Sorry, I'm hand-wringing now, but it's, making, it's, just, it's just making me feel better. Um, so, you know, you, you, the way we did it is to make it as least, particularly when you're working in the public sector, the last thing you want to present a politician with is a massive, great IT program. Uh, so just break it down into bite-sized chunks, get it out there, and then get the momentum going, and you'll be fine. Brilliant. That's a great way to end. If we could just thank our panelists. Thank you very much. <laughs>